Welcome to the Actionable Futurist podcast, a show all about the near-term future with practical and actionable advice from a range of global experts to help you stay ahead of the curve. Every episode answers the question, what's the future of? With voices and opinions that need to be heard. Your host is international keynote speaker and actionable futurist, Andrew Grill. Today's guest is Charlotte Gregson, the Managing Director for the UK and US for Comatch, a marketplace for independent management consultants and industry experts. Charlotte is a former consultant with a career that didn't take a conventional path. After an academic career culminating with a PhD in chemistry at Imperial College, her mind for molecules exposed a love for leadership after a stint in healthcare consulting. When she moved to consultancy Eden McCallum to build independent consultant teams, Charlotte began to recognise the potential of the professional gig economy and what it could bring to companies and their employees. Welcome, Charlotte. Hello, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Now, a really interesting career. We'll unpack that in a minute. But for those that aren't familiar with platforms such as Comatch, how would you describe what you actually do? I probably would say we're, we're a professional matchmaker, if, if that doesn't belittle too, too much of what we do. Um, essentially, we're a network of, of freelance consultants um, and project managers and, and industry experts. So we find relevant people um, for, for our clients to work on their, their project and, and interim needs people may have heard of other sites, um, I'm sure you are very different, but how would you compare to other freelance sites such as Fiverr and Upwork? We, I would say, are, are higher quality com- compared to sites like that. Um, we are a, are a closed platform, so we operate a, a high degree of, of, of vetting um, and discretion in terms of the, the roles and types of projects that, that we work from. Essentially, we're dealing with, with people who bring sort of backgrounds in the professional services. So that also means that we're a, we're a higher price point um, than, than some of those networks. More, more of on-demand talent rather than the, the gig economy, which I think is, is more commonly sort of associated with the, the deliveries and, and Ubers of the world. Yeah, we'll talk about how the whole gig economy is going beyond delivery and driving tax. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, I've been a consultant, you've been a consultant. So yes, there is a higher price point. And and we'll get into that because I think people are now looking at the gig economy for experience roles and experience hires. It's probably fair to say the boundaries between freelancers and established consulting firms are becoming a bit more porous. So have large consulting firms adopted a much more proactive approach to bringing freelancers into the delivery of their client engagements? For us, that's been one of the the major trends of of, um, emerging from the pandemic, actually. I think that really expedited the the shift in in how consulting firms were were engaging with, with external talent. Um, you know, I think some of them suffered from, you know, being able to, to ret- ret- retain and attract talent to their organisations, um, as well as for some, you know, the necessitating redundancies. Yeah, but all of that has, has meant uh, more blended teams um, are much more commonplace than they were maybe even 18 months ago. So you describe Comatch as a talent on demand platform. How does that work in practice? At the very simple end, someone can enter a brief on our on our website or send us an email. Regardless, actually, what we do like to do um, is to talk to the person about their need. I think it's really important to understand the um, nuances, uh, particularly around sort of style or cultural fit. Ultimately, that often determines the success of an engagement. You know, someone's functional or industry knowledge is uh, should be taken as as given, but how someone works, how they fit within an organisation, is really important. So once we've understood some of the nuances around that, you know, some of the things that you maybe can't write in a brief, like the chief exec new and doesn't get on with the CFO and the kind of personalities are involved, that allows us to use our algorithm to quickly identify relevant people on the hard factors side. You know, we would only look to to maybe invite maybe between 10 and 15 um, individuals for any one role. Um, That's out of a network of over 15,000. So we're very targeted in who we we approach uh, with a view to presenting maybe between two and four of those to the clients within 48 hours. So you mentioned that Comatch sort of plays at the higher end of the management consulting area. So what sort of experts and consultants are using it? So it's anything from someone who spent two years in a traditional management consulting firm all the way up to uh, former partners um, or indeed C-level executives 
the network is largely diamond shaped. So the, the majority of the people within the network probably have a good 10, 15, maybe 20 years of experience in, in their respective fields. Um, and quite often um, have a blended background between those that have spent time uh, in a consulting firm, um, but also then have gone on uh, to work in industry or, or to work for startups as well. So I've been talking for a while about the concept of an exec gig worker, perhaps an experienced CFO who doesn't want a five day a week job anymore, but wants to develop their portfolio career. Is this possible within your platform? And are you seeing examples of this occurring? Absolutely. I think um, interim executives are are really commonplace, especially for those C-level executives. We see most demand probably for CFOs, COOs, maybe CTOs. I think the portfolio really probably comes from them being able to play sequential roles. If there is a particular setup or need to, to bring someone in on an interim basis, it usually is for a defined period of time and it typically is more full time. Um, that's not to say you don't get that that light touch advisory with, with which people can then sort of intersperse their, their NED or, or advisory work. But, but definitely, I think um, increasingly at the executive level, people want that variety, actually, in terms of, of what their work life looks like. Well, I think over the last couple of years, we've all re-established and re-evaluated our purpose of going to work. And I'm hearing a lot of people saying, you know, I really want more of a work-life balance. And if my current employer can't offer that, I'm going to look, at, look elsewhere. This phrase, the great resignation has been bandied around. Is it really happening? And I'm sure a platform like yours really helps accelerate that. For me, it's more of a, a re-evaluation or recalibration. We're certainly getting movement in, in the job market. People absolutely, I think, are looking for for more from from their, their work than they perhaps were, you know, 18, 24 months ago. What that means for employers is is being able to really understand what, what motivates and, and drives people and, and I think there has to be an alignment of values in terms of the work they're doing, which ultimately dovetails really well with the freelance model, because the inherent flexibility and choice that exists within that, you know, to opt in and choose to do work for clients whose whose purpose or mission or product or whatever it is, you know, aligns with with them as individuals, is much more compelling for, for a lot of people. So those that have been involved in consulting firms would understand the the way to run a consulting practice efficiently is to have as many consultants engaged on active assignments and having fewer on the bench, which is where people don't have a current assignment. So is Comatch a way to manage that bench so you've got more people out there and maybe have fewer people on the bench and then you run a virtual bench? It allows firms, rather than having to staff for the highs, um, it allows people, consulting firms, to, to bring in talent where there is that um, you know, extra capacity that's needed for, for the peaks or indeed where specific expertise is, is required to, to input into projects. We've, we've definitely built out um, flex pools of resources for our consulting clients that that is in, you know, an ongoing or I, I don't want to say emerging trend because for some of our clients, they're quite well developed in that road. But, but having sort of pre-vetted pools of talent um, that they can access on an as-needed basis. It, it's typically aligned around a, where they see a, a demand in a certain industry practice or indeed on, on a certain topic like pricing or sales force effectiveness. Um, but I, I think that's quite an interesting change to um, you know the consulting uh, model overall. And, and indeed, I think people are increasingly there are quotas if you look at case teams that partners are uh, required to to staff a certain percentage um, of their case teams using external resources now which which again if if i think back a you know two three years that that would have been almost unheard of as, as a model so everyone i talk to is saying that the place they work whether it's a consulting firm or one of their clients they're no longer going to be required to be in the office five days a week I saw someone yesterday said it's 3-2, other people it's 2-3, which means we're all having to learn to work in a distributed way where we can't always walk over and talk to our colleagues. From your experience working with freelance consultants at Comatch, what tips do you have for working more effectively in a distributed way? With any project set up, it's really important to establish relationships. You know, the 3-2, the 2-3 model, I think that will become the norm. 
what therefore is important when you're working with a bunch of new people for the first time is that you probably invest in that face-to-face interaction up front so that you have a good foundation or have you know, built the relationships out to, to facilitate working together when, when you're not sat next to each other. So I think it, it varies during the life cycle of a project in, in terms of, of what that looks like, but, but definitely some face-to-face interaction, if possible, is needed. Um, otherwise, you're looking at making sure you're you fitting in with the with the culture and norms of the organisation. You know, in terms of ways of working, whether it's certain tools that that people are using. I'm still probably a bit old school, and it's it's always good to pick up the phone and talk to someone. I think rather than send you know <laughs> a lengthy exchange via via Slack or or email. You talk about the tools that people are having to use. We're all becoming very familiar with Teams and Slack and Zoom and those sort of things. Have you seen any other emerging tools that better facilitate distributed work? There's a couple um, that, that I've come across, I, either that, that we've used or that I've seen used on projects. Miro is quite a good whiteboard for when you know, you're, you're not in the same room and can't stick post-its up somewhere. I think Padlet's quite good as well in terms of, again, an, an, online, sort of an online board for, for collating ideas. Workshops in particular are, are quite hard to do in, in that remote setting. I think we've all got quite used to doing you know, Zoom or Teams calls uh, via video. And, and actually, the hybrid model will always necessitate uh, video calls. I don't think they're going away anytime soon because it's unlikely that everyone will be in the office on on the same day, which means that you, you do need um, the support of, of tools like this um, to, to better facilitate some of the things that you used to be able to do quite quite easily in person. Now, you touched on your style match technology, which helps understand where people are going to match with each other and, and fit in and the chemistry is right. Can you tell me a little bit more about how this works and what input it uses? So Style Match was developed um, by Co-Match and Catch Talent based on a work psychology model that's tailored to the consulting environment. So it assesses preferred working style and strengths of a consultant not along professional competencies, but thinking about um, attributes such as communication and leadership, collaboration, working methods, you know, preferred project framework uh, approaches. In our experience, as, as I alluded to earlier, that's that's really important for putting someone in an environment where they will thrive um, and make the best impact. Interestingly, our female consultants actually have a higher score for diplomatic communication style and tend towards being explorers rather than uh, structure fans in, in, in a project. Now, they're not significant deviations, but really being able to understand uh, people's individuals' profiles like that um, helps us assess how well we think they will perform in, in the particular environment that, that we're, we're asking them to, to work in. So where can AI play more of a role to match consultants with clients? For us, and in terms of the co-match platform, it, there's a speed and efficiency piece. So particularly uh, amongst you know hard factors, years of experience, you know background such as you know engineering qualifications, languages, uh, people's you know industry knowledge, functional experience, be, being able to quickly match and identify people that that tick those boxes is is important. Style match in terms of how we use it, that there's a set number of questions that are also coded into the platform. So that similarly is 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 pulled out by by the AI. All of that helps us be efficient. I think the thing that that will remain so, I hope at least for a while, you know, when we're dealing with people and dealing with talent, I don't think anything can be fully automated. Where you have, you know, matching algorithms, job boards that don't involve humans in that process. I, I, I really strongly feel that you're you're missing something in, in that, that overall quality of, of the output. It's certainly something uh, we at Comatch you know, take it very seriously as part of the proposition is really investing the time and getting to know our consultants is a very high barrier to entry to get into the network. And and we spend a lot of time getting to know people as they join through the project staffing process. 
and as part of feedback that that we we gather um, from projects once once they've done them with us. So um, we did over 1,500 projects as an organisation last year. Um, all of those feed into building an overall picture of what someone's like, what they're good at, and and where where best to to place them for success. Regular listeners would understand that I've spoken to many AI experts. Whenever I say, can AI ever have empathy or feel love? They say no. So the humans are always needed to be involved. But of course, we can automate this and make it a bit faster. That's, that's the good thing that AI can do. So are clients developing more of a self-service mindset to source pools of talent now that platforms like Comatch are established? I think some are. I, I think for businesses that are, are used to this as a model, that are comfortable, that have fairly straightforward requests, then that service model is is becoming more common. I think we see it more in marketplaces that are focused on, on the digital and creative communities in terms of it being much more commonplace that, that those marketplaces are, are run in a self-service fashion. Um, it's definitely something we've developed as part of our offering uh, in, in terms of, and, and again, I think it comes down to more that, that automation and speed in terms of PBA people being able to view profiles, select who they want to interview, choose which people they, they want to work with, and, and it, it just being quicker and, and more effective as part of that process. So how do you drive innovation at Comatch? Um, we actually have an innovation circle, so that's made up with representatives from, from across the business. I think that's really important uh, to get perspectives from not just our commercial teams, but also our, our product and tech teams and, and, and the team that, that look after our, our consultant community. I think with an innovation, um, it, it comes down to sort of brainstorming and bouncing ideas off people and regularly talking to the market and both sides of the marketplace because we sit in a very privileged position in the middle. So both taking on board feedback um, from clients and consultants um, and really thinking through you know, what that looks like in terms of future needs that that they might have. Um, it's certainly where the, the, the flex pool idea came from in terms of having that pre-vetted um, bench of, of, of talent uh, to draw from. So what do you think the freelance world will look like in the next, say, 12 or 24 months? Will it accelerate from where it is now that we're kind of getting out of this pandemic uh, mode? I like to think the future is freelance. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing um, what I did otherwise. I, I think, you know, coming back to your comments on people wanting, you know, purpose in, in what they do, flexibility, I think, will increasingly be become the norm. And so regular full time employment will find it hard to compete with that. So many people have um, increasingly so portfolio careers or, or a project on the side. Now, whether that project is their own business um, it might be something like building a house. It could just be a, a passion for a, a particular sport or pastime. But you know, enabling sort of people's lives and work and set up so that they can do more than just a job. Um, absolutely, I, I think that that will the momentum around that will will build because I think there's still a lot of education to be done actually in in the space. Whilst I've I've seen the needle shift and you know I've, I've worked in and around the, the independent space for over a decade now, uh, there's been much more traction in in the last few years, but but still it's quite surprising as as you're out in the market talking to clients. Um, for a lot of people, this as a model is is still unheard of and, and not widely used in organisations, and I think that ultimately uh, creates a lot of opportunity. So we talked about your career. You alluded to then that you've been in management consulting for 10 years. You started with a PhD in chemistry. Quite an interesting turn to get to where you are. You're now leading a business here in the US and, and the UK. What challenges do you face being a female tech leader? It's not specific to being a, a tech leader. I think it's just specific to being a, a female leader. Um, you know, if I look at commercial organisations, particularly sales organisations, there are there are very few women in in senior leadership positions. The consulting industry, you know, our network is reflective of that. So there's only about twenty percent women in in the network. I think people often think that this as a model is is more amenable to women, but actually that the numbers of women in the network are, are very much reflective of, of of what's mirrored in in the industry. So. 
you know, I, I think for me, I certainly some of the challenges remain that I don't have a good group of peers or indeed role models um, to, to look up to. And and aside from that, it's the fun and games of logistics of childcare. Um, <laughs> what I would consider the, the mental load of, of balancing being a working mum, I think probably are my biggest challenges, particularly so I think across the pandemic, women shouldering more of the caring responsibilities, more of the homeschooling responsibilities Abilities. And sadly, that meaning that, that, that many women were forced to step back from the workforce as, as a result. You talk about the freelance model being not well understood, but it's ripe for growth. You shared a Harbour Business Review article that quotes McKinsey as saying they estimate there will be 500 million freelancers working through platforms like Comatch before 2030. So how does this change the whole industry dynamic, not just consulting firms, but within their own clients as well? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I think increasingly solutions will will need to be more holistic. So I take the old adage that no one's, I don't think, well, there's probably an example somewhere, but in general, no no one gets, you know, fired for hiring McKinsey or, or IBM. That that brand stamp of approval is really important to a lot of businesses where they're making key decisions, where they need some extra support to to, to investigate or, or work through topics. But I think as, as that mix shifts and, and, it, and it will be a more blended mix between the firms or indeed the firms bringing in expertise from, from elsewhere, I think potentially that brand names could play less of a role and the focus will shift more towards, um, you know, trust and how well known the, the resources are. Um, and, and in that kind of world, you know, delivery of outputs will, will be key for success or survival. We often refer to, to some of our freelancers as living and dying by their last project, which sounds a little over dramatic, but in a lot of senses is true because how well they perform reflects not just on on them, but also on on you know the brand they are representing, whether that's someone like ourselves and if we're supplying direct to clients or indeed if they're white labeled as, as being part of a consulting team. So I've had a look at the platform. I've started my application. Hopefully you'll accept it. But how do you attract other quality freelancers to your platform? We're at a stage now, you know, seven years in where where a lot a lot of the growth comes from word of mouth, actually. The, the barrier to entry is very high. I'm sure we will accept you based, <laughs> based on your background, Angie, particularly given the, the, the time at IBM. We get a lot of people who've had good experiences working with us on, on projects, that understand the types of profiles that we're looking for, that understand the types of needs that our clients have that that will ultimately refer people uh, to us. So we're, I think we're in quite a fortunate position now, having made the investment early on where it's it's most, mostly word of mouth. I talked about purpose. That P is part of the three Ps of the future of work. I talk about people, place and purpose. And one of those Ps, place, I've often said that there will be a growth in the third place. As you'd be aware, Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks, he wanted everyone to have Starbucks as that third place. And as a freelancer, I have used a Starbucks as a third place. This is somewhere in between the office and the home. But with the rise of flexible working driving the need for these third places, do you think you'll see the need for them to be closer to where you live rather than where you work? I think so, because ultimately, if you're if you're looking at a change of environment from that perspective, it, it's probably to to get out of the house, or it's to enable people to to collaborate more effectively, um, without investing the the time in in travel. I mean, I know we we saw, I wouldn't say a mass exodus, but but certainly. Just if I look within my own personal network, people moving out of cities to the country, whether people still want to invest the time doing commute or if there are hubs that, that people can go to to, to work on, on specific projects. I think particularly for um, you know, perhaps some large corporates as well, where typically the you know, the, the main office site might be on an industrial park or, or somewhere a bit more remote, if you can have these third space or hubs may be more easily accessible, you know, in town or, or nearer to, to where people live. Um, again, I think it, it comes down to that flexibility and, and creating environments where 
people can work at effectively and, and thrive. So yeah, whether whether that is Starbucks, assuming it's quiet enough and the Wi-Fi is strong enough, I think yeah, there's probably a, a ripe market there for, for someone to to do that setup really well. Probably in a way that co-working spaces haven't done because of the formality that's involved in in needing to you know contract and have you know set fixed memberships. Well, I think even the the established players are now moving to a monthly sort of all-you-can-eat model or an on-demand model. But I am seeing in the suburbs when I'm walking around parts of London that these little cottage places are springing up because the, the issue is that the Regis and the WeWorks of the world, they all put their offices next to where the clients are in the CBD. And so that doesn't work. You've been going for seven years now. You've obviously got a pretty strong model. Can you talk about your business model and how you make money? Essentially, we're a source of business for our our freelancers. I think a lot of people go into the world of independent consulting because they have a passion for the delivery of the work, not because they're passionate business developers. So effectively, we are a a source of business for um, our consultant community. And for our clients, we're an access point to to finding the the best available resource to, to meet their needs. All of our consultants and experts work on a day rate basis. Those day rates are driven by a whole range of factors, you know, but include things like the length of the project, how relevant the expertise is, um, location if if travel is necessitated. Um, And so we, from a commercial perspective, we we charge a margin on, on those day rate fees. One that I can safely say is competitive, having worked for or set up a few of our competitors. Knowing uh, the rates that I was charged out at IBM versus, yeah, <laughs> eye-watering. There's a good degree of headroom, let's say, between our rates. Headroom is the, is the right term, yes. Uh, I, I definitely got a sore head on some of those quotes. You work across different markets. What differences have you seen between the UK and the US, for example? For us, there's not a, a huge degree of difference in, in terms of the needs and, and the buyers. I think the US market is particularly well served on the corporate side um, by a couple of, of key players. So um, actually for us, most of the business we do in the States focuses on on who we term our intermediaries clients. So they are other consulting firms and then private equity and, and their portfolio companies. What's been the biggest resistance from clients to adopt the hybrid workforce model? I think that probably varies depending on, on whether the client is, is a consulting firm or, or a corporate. Uh, for consulting firms, I think ultimately it's been the, the partners, you know, the partner that shouts the loudest often gets the resources that, that they need so that they haven't viewed it perhaps as an issue or till now or till it's reached critical scale. For corporates, it's probably a slightly different issue in that I think there's a probably negative association with if someone has to bring in talent that portraying them in a in a bad light in terms of them not being competent at, at doing their job. But actually, it's really where using an independent can often be more beneficial than, than bringing in a consulting firm because the, the premise is totally different in that the, the the independent will be matched closely to the client team. The client will retain ownership of the, of the project. Inherently, there's a lot of tacit knowledge and learning that gets transferred to the client team. Ultimately, in, in the independent scenario, the consultant is there to you know, make the client look good. When they leave the building, the knowledge doesn't leave with them as perhaps in the same way as certainly my experience of being a consultant, that that can happen on occasion. So I'd argue that digital transformation requires talent transformation. So what's your view on how work strategies will need to change? Any transformation requires change and and taking people with you on that journey. Um, So people need to understand not just why the transformation is happening, but how it's happening and and what that means for them. And depending on the capabilities or or the skill set of of the organisation, I think on occasion that that will mean changing the the mix of talent within an organisation. You know, ultimately, if you think about sort of technology in the digital context, that's rapidly changing the, the work environment. And that can be anything from from process automation um, and an associated workforce reconfiguration um, to perhaps something like augmented reality, creating a a better hybrid uh, working experience. So 
yeah, I think there probably will be an expected uh, concentration of job growth in in higher wage uh, occupations, and therefore the scale and nature of the work force transitions could could be challenging from a skills perspective. So from a thinking back to then, what did your work strategy look like? I think you need to factor that into both your longer term recruitment and, and retention strategies. We talked about some of the resistance that you face where existing models are being disrupted by bringing externals in. So what advice would you give a company that decides to turn core functions over to freelance workers where permanent employees might feel threatened? I mean, I think ultimately that Core functions shouldn't be ever fully turned over to, to freelancers, where I think freelancers can really support something that is by being integrated in, in, into, the, into the teams. I don't think for, for any core function, if you, you know, if you think about finance or HR, you might be able to outsource parts of it. But fundamentally, the business needs to retain ownership of topics like that. I would like to think if the setup and positioning is is done correctly, that employees will feel that they're benefiting from having that independent there. Hopefully they feel that they're learning something or hopefully they can see that that individual brings something that doesn't already exist but within the organisation and that, that would be a, a good thing. But, you know, as I said, very much depends on, on the setup and, and positioning, I think, in order to make that effective. So as an established platform for independent consultants, I'm sure you've seen everything. So how do you handle issues such as due diligence, IP, technology risk, anti-bribery, even anti-money laundering? I'm sure all these issues crop up in every business, not just yours. They do. We typically operate in, in line with, with our clients' terms. You know, that's particularly important around intellectual property rights, you know, who retains ownership of that. What it usually involves is extra documents being signed to, to make sure things like that are, are covered from technology risk, where how that typically is addressed is in terms of uh, clients providing uh, laptops so they're appropriately security encrypted. Um, you know, and couriered, couriered over to, to people. We, we did see that actually as, as a challenge, actually, in terms of getting the, the right bits of equipment <laughs> to, to consultants based in, in different geographies. That, that was probably one of the challenges of, of lockdown, but, but important in order to address risks like this. And in, in terms of things like anti-bribery, you know, anti-money laundering, it's why um, the vetting is so important in terms of uh, character references uh, and then additional background uh, checks can be done uh, as needed. That's that's particularly important for for more regulated industries where, where our clients sit in um, you know things like financial services or, or life sciences. Now for the sixty four million dollar question: What's the future of flexible working? I would say the future is freelance, Andrew. That mix of hybrid and, and remote working, uh, definitely in terms of flexibility. I'd like to think that there'd be an increase in, in a four-day-a-week model as well. Um, I, I know there's an ongoing trial in, in the UK at the moment looking at productivity uh, in relation to that. But, but I think that the future will definitely be all around making people more effective and, and helping align their roles with, with purpose and motivation. So before we finish, I want to run you through a quick fire round so we can learn a little bit more about you. iPhone or Android? Android. Window or aisle? Aisle, because I like to be able to get up and stretch my legs. Online or in the room? Uh, face to face, every time. Your biggest hope for 2022? I think that there'd be a little bit more stability. You know, if you look at COVID, if you look at the Ukraine, it would just be nice for people to kind of have a period where, the, where there's not huge global crises happening. The app you use most on your phone? WhatsApp. I think that'd be mine as well. It pays me regularly, certainly on, certainly on the school side to make sure I've not forgotten stuff. What's the one thing you won't be doing again post-pandemic? Uh, online drinks, although I did quite enjoy some of the online quizzes. What are you reading at the moment? Blood Orange, which is a thriller book by um, Harriet Tice. It was recommended to me by someone in the team. I tend to sort of mix fiction and non-fiction. So I've, I've just finished uh, Happy Sex Millionaire by Stephen Bartlett, which was also a, a good read. Final quickfire question. How do you want to be remembered? I'd like to be thought of as someone who was authentic and dependable and content. And I think for me, definitely important that I would have created better opportunities for my children. So as this is the Actionable Futurist podcast, what three actionable things should our audience do today when it comes to setting a hybrid workforce strategy? So I think the first thing is to 
properly identify and then articulate um, some clear needs or, or use cases for a hybrid workforce. The second thing would be to ensure you get both organize, wider organisational um, and stakeholder buy-in and, and engagement. And then for me, the third thing would be to work with a, a trusted talent um, platform, ideally, um, in, in order to, to deliver on those needs. And how can people find out more about you and your work? I post quite often on, on LinkedIn um, and I've also got various articles um, on Comatch's blog uh, on our website, www.comatch.com. Charlotte, a great discussion today. Thank you so much for your time. And it's great to learn more about how freelancers can actually have better purpose in their life. Thanks very much for having me, MG. Thank you for listening to the Actionable Futurist podcast. You can find all of our previous shows at actionablefuturist.com. And if you like what you've heard on the show, please consider subscribing via your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. You can find out more about Andrew and how he helps corporates navigate a disruptive digital world with keynote speeches and C-suite workshops delivered in person or virtually at actionablefuturist.com. Until next time, this has been the Actionable Futurist Podcast. Podcast.